Now that we've gone over some common ways to collect data or to uh, do measurements when it comes to psychological research, next we're going to move on very, very briefly to talk about statistics. And most people immediately hear the word statistics and get really worried about how complicated this is going to be. But if we think about it, statistics is just a way for us to use mathematics to try and organize or summarize or interpret some kind of numerical data. So this is us taking all of those measurements we've done and making sense of them, or making them presentable to someone else so they can make sense of them. So we're going to focus on two types of statistics, descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. Now, from the section that we're already talking about, we can probably assume we're going to keep going with descriptive uh, here for descriptive statistics, and we'll actually swing back for inferential statistics. However, descriptive statistics, in case we need to know, is just us organizing and summarizing the data that we've collected in some useful way. So once we start looking at this, you're going to think, well, that doesn't seem like statistics as I conceptualize it, mainly because all we're going to be doing is talking about the shape of the data that we have. Uh, inferential statistics is what most people think about when we start interpreting that data and drawing conclusions by making some inferences. So we'll make some statements based on probability, um, which again will come up much later on. So with descriptive statistics, what's one of our main things that we look at? Uh, and these are measures of central tendency, basically asking, Where's the middle of our data? Where's the center of all of the measurements that we took? And typically, when you think of finding a center point for reporting a single value for a collection of measurements, say we do our measurements of height, well, we'd probably report the average. So that is the mean. It's the center of our data set that we would collect by adding together all of our height measurements and dividing by the total number of measures that we took. The average is probably conceptually simple. You might also remember, probably from high school math, that we can also talk about the median and the mode, where the median is talking about the number that's right in the center. So if we take all of our height measurements and we put them in numerical order so that the lowest values are on one end of our uh, sort of string of numbers, and the highest value is on the high end, the farther end, then we would find the exact middle of all of those values. So if we had taken nine height measurements, then our fifth highest value, the one right in the center, after putting it all in order, would be our median. If you end up having an even number, you have to take the middle two numbers, add them together and divide by two. But still, we're looking for what is that number in the center if we put everything into numerical order. And then our mode is going to be the value that occurs most frequently. So how many people were measured to be five foot five? If there are more people who are five foot five than any other height measurement, then that would be our mode. Um, and for those who are more visual individuals, we can actually look at these um, sort of overly simplified uh, frequency distributions. So here on our vertical axis, on our y axis, we'd have something like proportion of the population or total number of measures or something like that, some kind of quantity. So the higher they are away from here, so in that vertical, that means the more of the people that we measured or of the measures we have have um, got that score. And then across the bottom, we would have whatever score it is that we're measuring. So we can use, we've been using height. So this could be the shortest to the tallest in terms of height, or it could be something like IQ, the lowest to the highest IQ score. And so we see that our mode is where that curve peaks. So that is the most people that got a particular score. What is that score? That's our mode. And so you'll find that that always falls right in the middle of our curve. If we look at our median, we're specifically dividing our measurements in half. So 50% of our measurements are lower than that median number, and 50% of our measurements will be higher than that median value. 
And this is a little bit different. You'll find it's shifted off to one side. So it's not sitting right at that peak. And that's because the median can be influenced by having a couple of values that are really high. Alternatively, we can have it shift the other way if we had a couple of values that were really low. But it just tells us that the median can be influenced by um, having outliers or very high or very low scores. And for our mean, we see here that this one has been shifted the farthest. So having those outliers, a couple of people with a really high score has now dragged our average over. So you can actually think of it as our mode being unaffected by those outliers. It still stays right in the middle of that peak. The median is slightly affected simply by the fact that there are now a couple of extra um, sort of numbers at one end of our line. Um, and then the mean is affected by the magnitude of those. So if you think about it, if our, um, we'll use IQ, if we had no outliers and our highest score was 150 for an IQ, which is very high, and then we had somebody else come in and they had 180, which I'm not even sure is possible, but that one value would now all of a sudden drag our mean upwards simply because it's so much larger than the other values. And we calculate the mean by adding those values together and dividing by the number of measures. So it's more, uh, it's more affected. So you can think of those in sort of least to most affected by outliers. All right, so that tells us where the middle of our data is, but it doesn't necessarily tell us much about um, the shape of the data. So we can actually use another term called variability to describe how spread out our data is. So what is that shape of the curve that we're looking at? There's a couple of different ways that you might have seen this. You've probably heard the term standard deviation and or variance. Those two are directly related to one another, where the standard deviation is the square root of the variance, or the variance is the standard deviation squared. Um, and there are ways to calculate that out. That's just not something that we need for this class. But what that standard deviation or variance is telling us is basically how far our scores tend to be from that mean, from the average for our data. So a higher standard deviation means that our data points tend to be further away from the center, and a lower standard deviation means that they tend to be closer to our average score. We could also report a range, um, and there's a couple of ways you can do this. You could just talk about subtracting our lowest value from our highest value. So what is the difference between the tallest person and the shortest person in our data set? Or we could just state this was the lowest score and this was the highest score, and people can figure out how much space is between the two. Both describe the range fairly well. Um, but all of this is just telling us what is our distribution, what does our data look like? And if that doesn't quite work for you yet, I have two diagrams that help well, sort of clear this up a little bit. So on this diagram, we have IQ scores. Um, and again, it's a frequency diagram. So this is just the number of people that we sampled with this IQ. There's no units because we don't really care, but they both have the same average, which any IQ score or any IQ test will have an average of 100 um, in a population it's been designed for. But we see that our male curve, so the purple line here, is a little bit wider than the uh, women's curve, the female curve. And what that means is that that purple curve would have a larger standard deviation, telling us that the data points are more spread out away from that middle point, away from that average. Whereas the female orange curve has a lower standard deviation because it is closer to that average. It is nearer that mean. And we can even see that the range would be different between the two because our highest and lowest scores aren't the same either. Um, and as once again, we don't need to calculate those values. We just need to understand how they would change depending on the shape of our data. And continuing with that shape of our data discussion, we were looking at positively skewed data on this slide here. But if we go with our nice clean lines, we can see that they've shown we have our mode, median, and mean least to most affected by those outliers. 
Um, the way that I like to think about this, to conceptualize it, is if we have a normal distribution, which for statistics has a specific definition and a specific understanding, and it's very important, but for us, we just care that it's symmetrical. That means that we're going to have our mean, median, and mode are all the same value. So with no outliers, they're all equal, so you'd only really need to report one of them. That uh, the three different options really only matters with skewed data. But if we think about it, if they're all starting as a normal distribution, and if we add one really high score to that normal distribution, then our curve looks more like this, where the tail points towards those outliers. So it is positively skewed because we have extra very high or very positive scores. Uh, conversely, our negative skew happens if we had added some low scores that are more extreme. And so here we see that that points off towards those very low scores or those negative scores, meaning the data is negatively skewed. And you'll find that those uh, different median or uh, central tendencies get dragged now in the opposite direction, pulled by those outliers. So hopefully that helps sort of understand conceptually um, what's happening with those different central tendencies, um, depending on the shape of our data. And that's all we needed for our descriptive statistics. So as promised, not super complicated quite yet. So with our wrap up here to talk about our descriptive research, what are some pros and cons? These shouldn't be super surprising. Pros, um, we're detecting and describing variables of interest. So here are the scores we measured. Here's what it looks like within that population. That gives us some understanding of that value. Pawns, we're not manipulating anything. So there's nothing about relationships or causality. When you're only measuring and reporting a single variable, you can't really talk about how it relates to other variables. That's what the other types of research are. Um, we can't manipulate things, we can't control things. So we're kind of limited with, here's what we found, we don't know what it means, but at least we now have this value. So we might instead choose to do correlational research, where we have two or more measured variables. So we're still sticking with measured variables, which means that a lot of the stuff that we used previously for the descriptive research section still counts here. But unlike descriptive research, where we're just measuring and describing, now we're also adding in that interaction, that relationship, between our two or more measured variables. So we're now saying, okay, we've measured two things. Do they relate to one another? Um, and we have to keep in mind the sort of famous statement that correlation does not equal causation, meaning that yes, these two variables might have a relationship, but we don't know the nature of that relationship. We don't know if A causes B or if B causes A. Or maybe A and B are unrelated to one another and are both being influenced by some other variable C. With correlational research, we can't differentiate between those three options without very specialized techniques that are very, very rare and beyond the scope of this course. So we're saying with correlational research, we can only make a statement that there are relationships between these variables. This is the pattern that we see between them, um, but nothing beyond that. So we can't make a statement of causality or directionality. And if we're gonna be, if we're going to be talking about correlations, we also need to talk about a correlation coefficient or R. And this is just a value that is going to describe the relationship between two variables. So R varies ranges between minus one and plus one. So it can fall anywhere between that. You can't have an R larger than plus one or smaller or more negative than uh, minus one. So that's our upper and lower limit. This is all of the possibilities here at the bottom. Um, we have two useful bits of information. The sign, whether it is positive or negative, indicates the direction or the type of relationship between our two variables. A plus sign means a positive correlation, and a negative sign means a negative correlation, which each get their own slides momentarily. Um, our second thing that we care about is the absolute value. 
So how big of a number is it? Is it closer to zero or is it closer to one? Ignoring the sign. So the closer we are to one means that it is a stronger relationship, a stronger correlation. The closer we are to zero means the weaker the relationship. Our sign has nothing to do with the strength of that relationship. The sign only tells us the direction. So positive correlations. This is when we see that as one of our variable increases, the other variable tends to increase too. And you'll notice I'm trying to use very neutral language because we can't say the directionality. We don't know if one variable increasing is causing the other to increase. So we say it very neutrally. So an increase in one relates to an increase in the other. The more birds I have, the happier I feel. And it could be that having more birds makes me happier, or it could be that being in a good mood makes me go out and buy birds. Um, either could be the case. We don't know from a correlation. But if we're looking at a positive correlation, our R is going to be larger than zero, um, and it will go up to that limit of positive point or 1.0. Um, so any of these values would indicate a positive correlation. And I include the visual because the numbers didn't necessarily click for me until I could get a number line, which feels a little bit grade school, but actually works for me. Um, our negative correlations are the other side of our number line. So R that is uh, sort of below zero all the way to our negative limit of 1.0. And so here, an increase in one of our variables is going to relate to a decrease in the other. So a mismatch here. So the more work I have, the less happy I am. Um, and it could be that working makes you unhappy, or it could be that being unhappy um, makes you do or makes you do more work or something like that. Um, and then our there we go. Uh, and then the last option is a zero correlation or a null correlation. It just means that our R is zero and there's not actually a relationship between our two variables. So they don't correlate with one another at all. And once again, if you are a visual individual and like graphs, here is a couple of examples. So we can see a positive correlation here. So if we drew a line of best fit between these two, we'd see that a lower score on X is also a low score on Y, whereas a high score on X is also a high score on Y. And this one makes sense. We have hours of studying versus grades. So the more you study, the better grades you have. Or it could be that those students who have high grades are also more motivated to study. Directionality, not guaranteed. Um, in the middle here, we have sort of this cloud of data, and it would be really difficult to put a line through that. So we can't really go this way and say it's any better than going the other way. It's not positive, it's not negative. This is a zero correlation. There's no relationship between how many apples you eat and what grades you get. It makes sense. And then a negative correlation here showing that downward uh, sort of trajectory. So a low score of Y matches a high score of X. A low score of X is a high score of Y, that mismatch between the two. Um, and then just to show that strength, I included this diagram because we have, yes, a positive correlation and a negative correlation, but here we have a positive correlation where each of our data points are more spread out. So what that means is that because these data points are clustered closer to that line, this is a stronger positive correlation. So probably maybe a 0.8. Um, whereas over here, where they're spread out like this, it's still positive, we can still draw our line. However, they're not as close, which means it's a weaker relationship, means it's closer to zero. So probably, let's say a 0.3. Um, and you'll notice that when we have the positives, the plus sign is sort of assumed, just like with other mathematics, you only really have to state the negative. Um, so if a positive sign is left out, we assume positive. Um, but if it's negative, there will always be a negative sign. So that's how correlations work. Um, so we've taken stuff that we've measured, we've looked at the relationship between the two, and then we can make some conclusions based on the reported value of R.
obviously this is a very much simplified way of doing this or of looking at this type of research. If you were conducting these experiments, you would be running statistics in the background. Um, so you'd actually calculate out your correlation coefficients, which once again is well beyond what you need for this course. For us, we more care on this is the value that we get after running our statistics. What does it mean? Um, so don't worry about the calculation component here. But with our correlations, what are our advantages and disadvantages? And we'll find that this is much more than what we had with uh, our discussion of po uh, pros and cons for um, just descriptive research. But for our advantages of correlational research, we get to actually see relationships that are present between these two variables. We don't know the directionality, we don't know the specific nature, but we can at least say, are they related to one another? positively or negatively. We can also use those graphs as, as a way to make predictions about those variables. So we can actually extend our line. So if we had here, um, so we have our studying in minutes and the most that we have, this last data point was somebody who studies, let's say uh, 80 minutes a night, but we wanted to predict what would be the theoretical grade performance of somebody who studies 120 minutes a night. Well, we would just extend our green line. We'd make that assumption because it's been a strong correlation so far that we could just extend that line and make a best guess for values that we haven't quite measured ourselves. We could also look at somebody who studies not at all um, and extend the line in the other direction. So this allows us to sort of look at um, things that we could measure in the future. Or we can make some sort of past expectations um, if we were looking at patterns and how things have changed over time. A whole bunch of different ways we can make use of that. Um, it also gives us the potential to identify real world associations. So if these two variables are related, that gives us the idea that maybe we could then follow up. Maybe we can do an experiment to determine the nature of that relationship. So X and Y are positively correlated, but is it because X causes Y or is it because Y causes X? Let's manipulate some things to see. So correlations can be really useful, especially if you have a large data set. You can run a bunch of correlations and for all the variables that don't relate to one another, you can kind of drop those and you can then focus future research endeavors on those that are related to one another. So sometimes correlational research can be a starting point for further experimentation. Um, it can also be its own standalone if all we care about is the fact that things are related to one another. Um, it's all about what you're researching and what your goals are. But of course, that brings us to our disadvantages. Um, so once again, we're working with measured variables, so we can't manipulate these at all. And because we can't manipulate anything, we can't assume that there is a cause and effect relationship we can't be sure of causality because our relationships might be caused by some third unmeasured variable that we weren't able to take into account. So correlational research shows an association, but not a cause, not a directionality. And so what do we mean by that? Here are a couple of examples. So if we look at this example here, where we look at birth order, and intelligence, which uh, there was actually a lot of research. People started focusing in on birth order fairly extensively for a chunk of psychological history, um, where there were certain things where we thought that the firstborn child tends to be like this or tends to have this personality type or so on and so forth. Um, but something like this, we'd say, oh my gosh, um, the firstborn children are far more intelligent than those that were born later. However, what if we haven't accounted for age? So what if our firstborn is 18 and the ninth born is 11? I don't, that probably doesn't work in terms of math, um, but six is probably better. So that difference in intelligence is not actually driven by birth order. Even though there's this strong correlation, it's completely driven by age. So that extra third variable can be something that's now driving this relationship. 
So we've run into a confounding variable, something that sort of messes with our findings and makes it so that we couldn't state that birth order influences our intelligence or causes our intelligence to fall at some particular value. Um, another thing here, they were saying, okay, so instead of having one variable being irrelevant in this situation, what if we looked at, say, that third variable that instead of replacing one is actually influencing both of the variables we were looking at? So here we've said that, okay, so individuals who have better social relationships tend to also be happier. So, okay, we might assume that um, stronger relationships make you happy or being happy makes you easier to form, uh, makes it easier for you to form good relationships. But what they've said is that if we account for our personality type, we find that having some value for this personality score predisposes you to be both happier and form better relationships. And if we were able to remove the effect of this other variable, all of a sudden the relationship between these two disappears. So in this case, Z is another variable that just explains away what we thought was a relationship. So these are meant to be our precautions that you can have other variables involved. You'll, you can call them at least for us where we don't care too much about the nitty gritty of the details. We can call them third variables or we can call them confounding variables um, because they are something that is the third variable in our consideration of these two um, and they confound or confuse our findings. So both work at least in the scope of this course. Um, if you get into specific methods and or statistics courses, they might hate that I haven't made a distinction, um, but for us, I don't care to make the distinction. All right, so those are our cautions about correlations. Um, what's next? Next, we can talk about experimental research. So finally, what happens if we are able to manipulate at least one variable? You can, of course, manipulate more than one, but as we've seen already, when we're talking about these different types of research, we're kind of considering the most simplistic version. So with correlations, we only talked about the relationship between two variables. With experimental research, we'll talk about measuring one variable and manipulating one variable. But we will acknowledge that you can do correlations between multiple different variables. You can have very complicated interactions between dozens of variables if you wanted to get really complex. And with research, you can measure multiple variables or manipulate multiple variables or both. But again, it adds complexity that makes it hard to conceptualize. So we'll stick with the simplest version for the most part, one measured variable, one manipulated variable, and then we'll expand. But once again, how does this new type of research compare to the others? Well, in our descriptive research, we were simply measuring and describing one variable. Um, so that was just the description, it doesn't tell us anything about relationships. Then correlational research, we looked at the relationships, but they were only measured variables. So we had no directionality, no causality. So now with experimental research, finally, we manipulate the variables that we want to under some controlled conditions so that we're sure that the changes that we see in our measured variable have been caused by our manipulations. So now we're gonna have some extra considerations, things like, are we sure we've controlled for extra stuff in the background? Um, and that's one of the questions you always have to wonder when you're conducting research, but also reading research, because we've already seen the potential effects of those third variables, and those can still be problematic in experimental research, because if you haven't accounted for them or haven't controlled them in some way, um, they can still influence our results. So they haven't just gone away because of manipulations. But we're focusing here specifically on detecting these cause and effect relationships. Can we establish causality? Um, and we're going to be testing those theories that we've put in place. Is our framework, is our understanding of how this system works correct? Let's generate some hypotheses and test those to see if we support the theories that we have. 
Um, and we already saw the theory data cycle or the scientific method, where if we gain evidence that supports it, we are more confident in that theory. Um, and if our hypotheses don't match up with our findings, then we have to make some changes somewhere along the line. Um, but we have some important variables, for, for some important, I guess, definitions to discuss. Um, and again, this might be complete review for you guys, but uh, our independent variable, or IV, is the variable that's being manipulated by the researchers. So a great example of this, we can talk about a drug trial, because it'll be a useful example for later too. But if we have a drug trial, and we want some people to receive the drug, and some people to not receive the drug, then receiving the drug yes or no is our independent variable. We could also have people who receive different doses of the drug, so uh, none, low, medium, and high doses. That would still be our independent variable because the researcher determines who receives what dose. So we've manipulated that variable, we've manipulated the dosage, so we know that's our IV. Our dependent variable, or dv, is the variable that's affected by the manipulation. So our measurement of the dependent variable will change depending on our manipulations. So if um, we were looking at an antidepressant, we would look at a measure of, say, mood, and we would hope that some of those people who received a certain dosage of that medication should show an increase in their mood. So their mood changes depending on the dosage they received. So our manipulation to the independent variable causes a change in the measure that we get of our dependent variable. So we're asking, how does our independent variable change or affect our dependent variable? We can also have some of those confounding variables. Again, another term being uh, extraneous variables or third variables. And again, some people would care to discriminate between those terms, um, sort of nitpicky ways. But basically, we can have extra variables that... Um, can affect our measures, that can affect our dependent variable that aren't necessarily controlled. So if we're looking at mood, what if uh, some people are being measured in the summer and some people are being measured in the winter? Uh, mood tends to be affected by levels of sunlight. So the people being measured in the winter might have lower mood levels, not because of whatever dose they're receiving, but because of the time of year. So that would be a confounding variable. And we would have to make sure that we run all of our participants at the same time of year, or that we would run half of them in the summer and half in the winter, but each of our dosages would be equally split before, between those two times of year. That allows us to control for that confounding variable. So there's a couple of ways you can get around it, but those variables can affect our findings, and so we want to try and think of them whenever possible. All right, next terms, population versus sample. Now, population is a term you might have heard in relationship to biology courses, where they'll typically talk about a uh, group of interbreeding individuals that all live in a similar geographic area. For psychology, we use per, uh, population in a different way. So here, we're still looking at a set of individuals, but this is specifically the set of individuals that we want to draw a conclusion about. So if we are studying mood, our population would be whichever group of humans we want to be able to improve mood in. If we're really optimistic, we'd say all humans. Or maybe we'd specify to uh, human adults or adult humans, whichever. Um, so we'd say, okay, we want to apply our sort of study on this drug to all adults in the world. So that would be our population. And obviously that is a really ambitious uh, goal. And of course, we can't test on the entire adult population of Earth. So we have to take a smaller subset of those individuals to study. And we would call that subset our sample. And so we draw our sample from that population as a whole. 
Um, and there's a couple of different ways that we can decide who ends up included in our sample. So I will start off saying that this is not an extensive list or a, a sort of entire list of all the possible ways that you can sample. This is just a subset to give us some ideas. But we're going to have two main categories, simply being random sampling, like the two at the top, or non-random sampling, like the one at the bottom. However, um, you can break it down into different techniques. But if we start with the top, a simple random sample is a type of random sampling method where everyone in our population has an equal chance of being selected for our sample. So in this situation, we'd say, okay, so if we have the um, ID numbers of every human on Earth, which not viable, but let's go theoretically, there exists something like a social insurance number that exists for all humans on the planet. And so we have access to that database and we'd use a random number generator to select um, a, a subset of those individuals. And as long as we're using something random, then everyone has an equal chance of being selected. I guess you could think of it as um, people at a raffle. So if you get only one ticket per individual, um, then everybody has an equal chance of being selected as the winner of that raffle. That would count as simple, ra simple random sampling. Um, in reality, a raffle ends up being a little bit biased because you can buy more than one ticket to increase your odds, uh, but we wouldn't want that to stay random to give everyone equal chances. Um, clearly, a simple random sample is pretty much impossible to do, um, at least in the theoretical way. There's almost always going to be some kind of limitation. Um, so this is like our ideal, this is what we aim for, but it isn't always attainable. Um, another option would be a stratified random sample. And so this is really useful if you have, say, a collection of individuals where out of your population, there is a very small number of individuals of one particular subgroup type. Um, so if we were looking at, um, I guess we can use people from different countries. So if we want representation for different countries that matches the representation in the population, if we have a place that has a very low population, there aren't that many people from that location, if we just use simple random sampling, because of chance, we might not select anyone from that very small group. Um, so we just might miss them because there were so few of them to begin with. So what we could do instead is say that, okay, 50% um, of our population at this Canadian university is from Canada, so we're going to take 50% of our sample from that subset. And then 10% of people at the university are from the US, so we're going to take 10% of our sample from that subset, and so on and so forth, where you're still randomly sampling, um, but we're specifically picking the different proportions. We are stratifying it in order to ensure that our sample is representative, which um, I guess we can hop to the next slide for the proper definition of that. But a representative sample is just saying that our sample reflects some important characteristic of a population. So with my example of we want to know which country someone is from, um, we would want the country distribution in our population to match the country distribution in our sample. And if we have a representative sample, our example here being our population, all of our different uh, letters and colors represent a different country, our representative sample matches that distribution. The pie charts look the same. If we end up with an unrepresentative sample, some groups can end up being overrepresented and some groups can be underrepresented. Um, and in that situation, any conclusions that we draw based on this unrepresentative sample, it's harder for us to be sure that those findings apply back to the population as a whole. So ideally, we want as close to a representative sample as possible. Once again, there are always going to be limitations, but this is our goal. 
And you might have figured out, but using some of our random sampling methods, this is a way to try and make sure that everyone in the population has an equal probability of being chosen, and that should help us to make sure we have a representative sample. We just sometimes have to take extra precautions if there are small groups that might be over, uh, overlooked through just a pure random sample. And there are a couple of modifications depending on the situation, but these are the big ones we care about. For non-random samples, there are tons of ways that you can do non-random sampling. So you, this usually happens because of study constraints, where ideally we would love to look at the entire adult population of the world, but as psychology researchers, we only have access to, say, the undergraduate research pool at our university. So now we don't have all adults, we only have the people at the university. So we're limited to people who have a background that has allowed them to get into post-secondary education. They are probably mostly around a particular age since it is a first year level course um, and things like that. So we've already introduced some bias where any findings that we draw based on this non-random sample um, and this unrepresentative sample means that it's hard to make sure that those conclusions in our experiment apply back to the larger population. So we have to be aware of those limitations of our samples if we're trying to interpret the findings of a study. Because if the sample was biased, if it wasn't representative, then the results are not necessarily as directly applicable. Um, and our example of a subject pool would actually be called a convenience sample. That's because we're working with what we have. So they are convenient and easily available, therefore we work with them, but it introduces bias into our sample. There are tons of other ways to non-randomly sample, some of the famous ones being things like uh, snowball sampling. It's really common for medical research when you have a very rare group um, with a particular disease. And so what you might do is find a couple of individuals with that disease or disorder and ask them to put you in contact with other people they know with that disease or disorder. So usually you'd go through things like maybe support groups for people with this disorder. Um, and that would get you access to more participants, but because you've had to go out and actively target people, your sample itself is biased. Um, and you have to make that choice of do you want the biased sample or do you want to run the risk of not having enough participants to actually conduct your research? So usually with our non-random samples, we're trying to weigh the pros and cons um, of using this method versus um, what happens if we don't use that method. And again, each situation will have different sort of considerations in mind. But those are some of the basics. All right, so yeah, we want a representative sample as much as possible. Uh, we would like to avoid unrepresentative samples, but it is not always possible to do so. And if we're talking about this logicking and reasoning about those non-random samples, what are some things that we would consider? So I have a couple of cases where it can be okay to have a non-random sample, to have a biased sample. Um, so our three main situations that I've come up with, um, maybe the similarity of a sample and a population doesn't matter. So if we're just looking to say that something can occur, then a simple example of it occurring in anyone within that population is sufficient to make that claim. So you don't really need a representative group of individuals from that population. You really just need the one case to show that it's possible. Uh, our second is that um, this is getting back to that idea of replication where if we've had multiple experiments conducted on different samples pulled from different populations, if they all have similar results, that gives us more confidence that our research could apply, could be um, sort of generalized to a larger group than what we had originally thought. So if I've only been able to conduct my research at universities in Edmonton, but we also have someone who did research uh, on universities in Ontario and someone who did some research with 
say instead of universities, um, what about a senior's home somewhere in the US? Well, now, instead of only being able to talk about uh, Edmontonian university students, now we could probably make a conclusion about adults in North America. So by having multiple experiments that have all replicated or found the same results in different scenarios in different populations, um, that gives us a little bit more confidence in generalizing those findings. Um, and sometimes, for our last option, sometimes the similarity of our sample and our population is reasonable. And what this just means is that we don't necessarily need a representative sample to understand what it is that we're looking at. So maybe we're doing a bunch of brain imaging just to see what are the general shapes of all of the different structures. And if we don't really care, as long as a brain is a brain is a brain, um, we could just look at university students or we could just look at the people in this one city because there aren't massive differences in where structures are located, at least not to the degree that we care about. So yeah, the sample is biased, but it's a brain shape and it doesn't really matter to, for us to have more of a representative sample. Um, that's probably an oversimplification and we'd probably care, um, but it's what I could come up with off the top of my head. So yeah, sometimes you can make an argument for not having a random sample, um, or sometimes you can acknowledge that your sample is non-random, and it just means that we have to be careful with how we apply that knowledge, um, because that's the best you can do. So now that we have our sample, now that we've picked who we're going to be conducting our research on, what's the next step? Um, so next we can talk about our experimental group versus our control group. And I've already kind of hinted at this already, talking about our drug trial example, saying that we could have one group that receives a certain dose of the drug and one group that does not receive the drug. So in this situation, the group that receives the drug would be our experimental group. So some subjects or participants who are receiving some treatment um, based on our independent variable. So the researcher determines who receives what amount or what value of that IV. Our control group are going to be a similar group of subjects who do not receive that special treatment. Um, so this can be our comparison group. We want to compare our scores in the end between the group that received some treatment and the group that did not receive that treatment. And so if we are sure that these two groups start off fairly similar to one another, so we're saying they're alike in all respects, um, and we would use a technique called random assignment here. Um, so I think, actually, let me double check. I don't there's probably a slide for it later, um, but we've been talking so far about random selection for selecting our sample. Random assignment is the next step where we assign the participants that we have into our two different groups. So you flip a coin and heads, this person is in the experimental group and tails, they are in the control group. Um, so we have that randomness introduced to split apart any potential variation. And so because of our random component, our experimental group and our control group should be pretty much similar to one another, or at least they shouldn't vary in a predictable way. Um, we can then manipulate our independent variable for one of our groups. The other group does not receive that treatment. And then the difference between the two groups, if they started out similarly, should be due only to that manipulation. So if our groups start with the same mood score and one group receives the drug and the other doesn't, then if our experimental group that received the drug is happier at the end of the experiment, then we would say that that increase in mood would be due to um, the treatment that they were given. And in this case, getting a before and after measure really helps us make sure that the two groups started off similar and that their scores ch changed over time. But we can also compare between the groups as well, saying that our treated group um, had a higher mood score than the untreated group, so the drug is effective in boosting their moods. Um, usually you'd like to try and measure as many things as possible.
We should also note that there can be an influence of expectations. Shouldn't be surprising. People are very easily influenced. But the placebo effect um, basically says that people might assume that they should be getting better um, simply because they've received a pill. And so that's why you might have heard of the term of a placebo, which is a treatment that has no therapeutic effect, but it's going to emulate some other aspect of the treatment. So if our experimental group received a drug and it was in pill form, then the uh, placebo group, our control, placebo control, I guess, um, should receive, say, a sugar pill. So they don't know that they are not being treated because the expectation of treatment actually leads people to assume that they should feel better and therefore they do feel better. So by giving them that sugar pill, we are making sure that it isn't just their expectations, but it's actually the effects of the drug. Because the placebo effect says that getting that treatment, even if it's a sugar pill, can still change what they experience because of their expectations. So that's really important to keep in mind.